Ben Lindbergh of The Ringer is here. He's been on this program uh, many times, and we talk about uh, the uh, analytics and uh, sabermetric view of baseball. And now that is uh, being tested in a 60-game <laughs> season. But what are the limits? We know there's you know, the random variance. There's a lot to it. But 60 games, how far along to enough is that to get a sense of a real season? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about a team, if you look back historically, about 30%, a little more than 30% of the teams that were in playoff position after the first 60 games of a season don't end up making the playoffs. But this year, the season doesn't go on. So everyone who's in playoff position at that point makes the playoffs and we'll never know whether they would have kept it up or not. So you do learn a lot about a team. You learn more in those first 60 games than you do in the rest of the season. But there's still a lot of random variation there. And, you know, maybe the, the Dodgers, maybe the Yankees, maybe they'll be OK. But if you have some of those teams on the margins, there's a lot of fluctuation. And the same goes for players, of course, who can have real statistical extremes in either direction. And it's maybe tough to tell the difference if you're looking at something like wins above replacement, which we're used to looking at. Well, in a 60 game season, an average player produces about 0.7 wins above replacement. It's a small number. And so if you're trying to decide between, well, this guy's got 2.3 and that guy's got 2.8, that's not really a meaningful difference. Right. I um, want to get back to players, though, for a second. What What is the variance of players? Because we ran the weighted runs created plus leaders and trailers, and the trailers never really went over, I think, 85. And the top guys, like Mike Trout, like their lowest was a 168, where I think they were in 180-something for the regular season. So six months for a player playing all throughout, for the top players, and worst players at least, seems to be that they will produce what you would think, about right. what you would expect. Yeah, I mean, you know, you look at what a guy does over a 162-game season and maybe a great war, a trout-level war is 9 or 10 even. And so you might say, well, just divide, and, you know, it's 37% of that, right? That's the percentage of the full season we're playing. But you can't just do that math because it's not as if guys produce completely consistently over the course of a season. Right. They might have two hot months, right? Someone can have a hot streak that lasts this whole season. So when you're talking about how good can a guy be in two months, well, we ran the numbers on that at, at Fangraphs, and I wrote an article about it at The Ringer, and it turns out that you can be five, six wins of, of value over even a 60-game stretch. And the highest we've ever seen, going back to 1974, is George Brett in his 1980 MVP season, mm. when he was worth six and a half wins in his hottest 60 game stretch. So that's the upper limit. That's how good you can be. And over a full season, that's an all-star season. That's maybe even an MVP caliber season. He crammed that into about two months of that 1980 season. But right. we've seen guys like Trout go over five wins. You know, last year he was around four and a half. Bellinger, Yelich were close to that. The only guys who've been over six are Barry Bonds in 2001 and George Brett in his peak season. But you can be in that four to six range, which if you extrapolate over a full season, that would be more than anyone has ever produced. But right. you can do it if you cram it all into a couple months. I'm glad that's that because we do have this for those old enough to remember. Like George Brett for periods of time was about the most frightening baseball oh, player yeah. you'd ever see. He could take things over. Um, so that's, a, that's like the upper limits there to have like a six win season right. this year. And you can carry a team with that kind of, you know, that's, right. uh, that's one out of every team, 10 team games this year, right? So normally baseball limits how much a star player can really change one team's fortunes. But in this year, if you have that incredibly hot two months, you can kind of put a team on your back in a way that baseball players usually can. Do you think someone's going to hit 400? This is what it comes down to, because we still care about 400 hitting. Do we I, care about that? I don't think so. I think someone's going to make a run at it, but the odds are against someone getting mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Uh, what are we to learn about home field advantage now that we're not going to have fans? <laughs> That's the big question. How much is the fans? You know, how much does that contribute to home field advantage? Because home field advantage has been incredibly consistent over the decades. Typically, the home team wins about 54 percent of the time. But it's been a mystery. What is that? Is that fatigue? Is it travel? Is it sleeping in your own bed at night? Is it knowing the layout of the ballpark, playing the caroms off the walls? Or is it the fans? Is it the psychology, the motivation? And there's some evidence that one of the big factors may be on umpires, not players, actually. And so if you look at everything that goes into a ball strike count, a ball strike call, the count, the location, the pitch type, everything, it turns out that the home team is about 1.7 percent more likely to get the strike call and that, if you turn that into the, the math, that actually accounts for about a third of home field advantage. Mm. So this year, maybe if it's the fans, if it's the umpire saying, hey, I better not anger the home crowd, or hey, they thought that was a strike, I, I guess I'll go with them. Either one, if you take that away, then there's not much of a home field advantage. And if you take away the rest of it from the psychology, from whatever it is, 
maybe you don't have that. And that's been a staple of all of baseball history. We've seen in other sports so far that have played without fans, there really hasn't been a home field advantage mm. so far. Will, will it be faster? Will games be much faster, a little faster without <sighs> crowd there? I'd like to say so, but I, I don't think so. I, I think the players are the ones slowing it down more so than the fans. I know the one um, fanless game that we had, the game in Baltimore, I know Joel, right. Joel Sherman wrote about it today, and I, I was surprised. I was like, that game was played like two hours, three minutes. Yeah, it could be. We just have no sample to go on. That's one of the things we're going to learn this year. We'll find out tomorrow night. <laughs> Maybe How about so. that? Yeah. I'll get Ben Lindbergh's stuff again on the Ringer.